then we have Mary Kina from North Dakota. She's going to talk to us a little bit about composting and convincing people to compost, correct? Sort of. All right. <laughs> Leslie, I left a slide up. If I haven't gotten to that by five minutes, give me the stand up. Okay. I'm Mary Kina from North Dakota State. So I'm going to take a, a little bit completely different route from the first two where I'm going to talk about communication. And so if you don't want to listen about communication or education, you're welcome to go on out. I won't feel bad. Um, and so this project, um, this presentation was a project that was funded by the North Central uh, Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education. So North Central there funded this project and we really appreciated that. So what happened is uh, Chrissy Smoderman from the University of Minnesota called me one day and said, hey, I have this idea for a project. I think we should do it together. Uh, Multi-state's always better, right? And so she's the idea person. And then I like to think I'm the muscle. And then we had to bring in the brains. And so we brought in Melissa Wilson from the University of Minnesota, who we've heard from earlier today, and Jeff Gale, who is an extension agent in Foster County, which is where the uh, Research Extension Center is located, where I'm at. So we brought in a county agent. Uh, to help us with this. So the purpose of this project, when Chrissy's called, she said, uh, we know that there's a lot of benefits from composting manure. And so uh, Chrissy and I are basically like the Glen Arnolds for North Dakota and Minnesota. Uh, and so we run around the state doing manure stuff and we get to work with a lot of smaller farms. Um, and so we know that composting is a way for them to manage manure. Composting manure in Minnesota, North Dakota, however, has yet to gain a lot of popularity. There's some folks that do it. There's some folks that say we do it, and then when we really have the conversation, they're actually stockpiling. Um, and then we have to argue about that for a little bit. So what we did is we called some compost producers from North Dakota and Minnesota. Um, and ultimately, when those guys answered their phones, they didn't know it, but they were going to then be our future um, cooperators on our project. So to do this, we needed some farmer cooperators to be a part of this grant. So one of them said, um, it's a lack of understanding and time management. So we, we asked them like, why don't people come? Okay. It's a lack of understanding and time management that holds most other farmers back from composting manure. They don't know how much composting can actually help their operation. So this was a combination of, we had a feedlot, we had an agronomist who had to use the manure from a feedlot, a big feedlot in Minnesota, South Dakota. And then we also had um, a smaller guy who focuses on organic farming. Uh, he has no livestock, but he gets manure from his um, neighbor and he composts. And then we had uh, another producer who has a big feedlot with his wife's family, but also he has a big composting operation as well. Um, his dad started one in the eastern or western part of the state, and now he has one in the eastern part. So a lot of combination in these producers. Um, and then one of them said, when I started researching composting for my farm, I took a three-day class in Illinois became uh, because there was nothing available around here. He went on to say, if there was something available, I, I'd really like to help. Um, and I think it would be useful. And so all of that helped us to get uh, the funding to do uh, this partnership. So NDSU partnered up then with the University of Minnesota. Our plan was to do four workshops in two years, two in North Dakota and two in Minnesota. Um, and so we, we changed our plans. COVID came slamming in uh, right in the midst of our planning. And so in April of 2020, we had to pull the plug. Um, we, we knew at that point nothing was going to happen that we wanted. And so instead of just canceling all together, and, and we contemplated it, like by that point we had done, um, all of us were working on other projects um, and trying to figure out what our lives looked like. And uh, we contemplated just, let's just straight up cancel. Or how can we maybe, we'll just extend it out a year and just go into 2022. But we also have other projects that we're kind of going to be starting up that were in, in the pipeline already. We didn't really want to drop it. So what ended up happening is we did an online workshop for 20, and then we went back to in-person in 21. So what did we do? For online, the online workshop consisted of 13 videos. Uh, those videos were emailed to the registrants two weeks before we had a live Zoom session where they could talk to all of us presenters, as well as uh, the producer cooperators that were a part of this program. On-farm interviews with each of the producer cooperators um, happened to show the registrants just the different abilities and the different ways that composting can happen. Uh, we have bigger operations and smaller. We have big equipment and small equipment. Um, it was all a little bit different. And that actually ended up probably being one of the coolest parts, I think, of the program. But we'll talk about that later. Okay, the videos are still available. So all 13 videos are still available. Um, I hot linked it there, but also if you want it, you can talk to Melissa or myself. And they've been viewed collectively over 3,000 times. 
All right, so what did we do in person? The in-person workshops were held in July and August of 2021. And so each workshop covered the same material. So we just basically took the online stuff and made it live. And instead of having it um, where, you know, obviously people could take it at their own pace and watch the videos when they wanted, we did like an eight hour class. It was two, uh, one full day in Carrington and one full day in Morris, Minnesota. The producer cooperators also came to each event. And so they drove to Carrington, they drove to Morris, and we actually had them like all of, all of us kind of took a break for a little bit and we let them take over. We let them do the pile diagnostics, talk with the people, really work one-on-one -on -one with the folks that were there. So this is what our setups look like. Um, so while we had, this is part of my question. And when, when Leslie stands up, we're going to do some Q and A in here. I'm going to ask a question and you're going to answer. Um, so we had eight people in Carrington um, in 2021. And so our setup was outside um, and inside. So we, we have a, a nice building that we can go in and we didn't have a lot of COVID regulations anymore in North Dakota. And so we were able to be in and out um, just in case of weather. In Minnesota, we had 23 people, I believe, and we were all outside. We actually piggybacked onto the, the backside of another program that Melissa and Christie's were doing. So the tents were already set up out in the field and that worked really nicely. And so in Minnesota, um, they have these piles of compost. They were essentially just like literally doing what a producer would do that has no compost turner. They took the piles of manure, they put them out in the field and they turned them. Um, and so we have different piles at different times. So we had some turned three times and some that weren't turned and some turned two times. We had high nitrogen and low nitrogen. We had high carbon and we had too wet and too dry. So we had all kinds of piles. Um, and then same thing in Carrington, but we have a compost turner. So we were able to actually um, have different, different rows at different um, levels of composted. Okay. What have we learned? So online, we had 180 people that registered for the online workshop and 50 actually joined that live presentation um, on that day just to discuss. It wasn't even a presentation. It was just a discussion. We literally, when the people registered for that, we asked them, what question are you going to ask during the discussion? Uh, and that discussion was, was pretty lively. 43 responded to the immediate follow-up survey where over 60% of them thought uh, the self-paced format was excellent. The amount of material was excellent. The topics covered were excellent. All right, 58% reported uh, that they had altered their manure practices. And this was a follow-up. This was like the, the later follow-up um, evaluation that we sent out. So moving the workshop, workshop online for the first year allowed us to fully engage our producer cooperators. They appreciated that the videos were individual by topic, um, that we didn't try to squeeze everything in. They were able to fit it into their day more easily. Okay, so then going to the in-person, what have we learned? 31 people attended the workshops and uh, we sent this, we sent the um, four-month follow-up survey. Only 10 people took it. And so 100% of those 10 that did not make changes, so some people did make changes, but 100% that did not make changes were actually all agency folk. Uh, and so I thought that was okay. There are people who are university extension, research um, agency, they're working with the people who are doing the thing. And so they came to the workshop. They probably didn't attend online, but they came in person and we still had an impact on them. So I take it more as a train the trainer. The workshops both online and in-person facilitated discussion, mutual learning. Um, and so that was all good stuff. All right. I talked through that really fast because here's what I want to get to. Okay. The challenge. All right. So the question I've been asking myself, and I asked a few people here this morning, and they're probably thinking I'm going to go off the rails, but I think there, there's a couple things here. So we've got the in-person, which is, is really good. And that's what we're used to. And then there's the online, which was new, but it really worked for some of us. So time to plan the online workshops was a challenge because instead of us just being able to like show up that day with our presentations in hand, pop in the computer, do our thing, go outside, whatever. We had to like really plan this sucker in advance. And it was a, it took a lot of time. And then the videos that we did with the producers, we had to line it up with our videographer, go to their places, give them the questions beforehand and ideas. So, I mean, they felt really uncomfortable doing this with us until they knew what questions we were going to ask them. At which point they were like, I mean, they talked, you know, we could have five hour video up there for how much information they shared, but it was time. It was time to go and do that and line it up and do the thing. And then for our person to edit it, um, it all took a lot of time. So contrary to that, there's the expense of doing an in-person workshop. And so time for the online, but also expense for the in-person. And this is where I struggle a little bit. So I had eight people in Carrington and we marketed the heck out of this thing, but everybody else in 2021 marketed the heck out of their stuff because it was like, get out of the house time. 
there were so many meetings last year. And so the people that came got a lot of really good one-on-one time. We had great discussions. It was fun actually, because we just moved the tables around at the end and got together and did our panel at the end really close. Um, I've actually had, so one guy went out and bought a compost turner. He's doing the whole thing. Like he bought into this hundred percent. He's ready to go. So it was good. We like those connections, but the expense comes from, we had, we were in a drought last year. We were in a severe drought in North Dakota. We're still in drought, even though it's blizzarding at home. And so the expense of our turner, it's really old and we have to fix it. It breaks every single year. And it did last year. Uh, we had a water this year, which took a lot of time. Uh, and you saw the picture of us watering. This is how we do it. So we have a, a trailer and we put a tank on and we water. And this is the expense of doing, of turning and managing six rows at all different stages and having those people there to do that. So what changes has everyone made following COVID? A lot of you are educators and work with people. So I want to know, what have you kept and what have you gone back to? Uh, what did you go back to prior to COVID and what are you doing different now? Because we've talked a lot um, Melissa and Chrisis and Jeff and I about, do we like the online was really good. We had 30 people our 31 States, I think that had that joined and registered for that workshop that we're now in communication with, but also people really want the live workshop, 29 people total. I mean, who, are you, who do you want their private digital operators or. Uh, yeah. Companies? So the, the question is, what's the demographic? Who do we want to come to these meetings? Do we want private individual um, what are we looking for? So in this, we were looking for, uh, we marketed a lot to smaller producers, small farms, but we were open to any of our bigger folks coming as well. So in Minnesota, we actually ended up with a handful of uh, horse producers, and, and which is exactly what we wanted, smaller farm folks. Uh, North Dakota, I actually ended up with bigger people, feedlot, um, backgrounders. Is there anything, um, I don't know how much time I have left, Leslie. Okay. Okay, perfect. So is there... Have you guys changed the way you're you're doing your programs now? What does that look like? Um, a lot of people are asking for hybrid formats where you do it live and kind of what we are doing in this conference, but with our extension programs. So yeah, it's a challenge. <laughs> and so are you doing the hybrid model then? And some programs, yes. Although, although when we came back to, to live, we have huge attendance. People were eager to come back to life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that were first programs, the first six months we start doing live. Well, all full, we leave people outside sometimes on some programs. Another comment, as, as your case, um, the thing that COVID brought with online was uh, it boosted our audience terrible. I mean, it was amazing. We have people, I mean, 10 times more 50 times more, mm -hmm. uh, and from, as you say, different uh, states or countries even mm -hmm. attending. Yep. So, so I mean, that's a very positive uh, side on this. It's very positive. For some of our programs, we have everyone, a lot of people want to do the hybrid as well. We've been at least trying to do more with your phone, taking little videos of our research plots or something anytime we're out there, and then we can kind of post those online to give people a little bit of a taste of what our research is doing. So mm -hmm. definitely videos are a bit, have been helpful. Um, the thing, I think like this hybrid programs are great for events and maybe for modules like this videos. Mm -hmm. But the thing with this kind of programs that I think that you have is that you really need follow up. You know, it's like many people just look at it and see the video and it's like, OK, great, I learned. But for them to do it, you really do need follow up. And I think that that follow up is very hard to to do if you're hybridizing it like that follow up. I think it's important to be in person follow up mm -hmm. more than like the event or the educational part. So I help. Uh run a program for training people that handle a lot of manure uh, and apply a lot of manure. And um, when, when COVID came, we, we switched from in-person trainings to completely online during 2020 and for most of 2021. Uh, this year, we're, we're not necessarily doing specifically this type of hybrid system, but we're taking our live presentations, recording them, and then also uh, providing them in a, a webinar format so that anybody that can't attend at that specific time can come mm -hmm. back and, and get that training. Uh, the other thing that we've done since most of the, the, the people that are coming to our trainings, they, they have to acquire those hours for certification 
we're starting, we haven't implemented this yet, but we're, we're starting to formulate new ways to uh, ensure that people are doing those trainings, right. like possibly providing exams or retooling our certification procedures to ensure that the education is getting through to, to those people that need that training. Okay. So uh, thank you for sharing. Uh, I'm really just curious because I don't know. Oh, hold on one more. I'm in two situations. I'm a member of the conservation district in our mm -hmm. county. So when those five people get together, I think there's a lot of body language and other things that help to construct the discussion. While when we're online, it's just uh, people on a screen. And uh, just last week, we had our first meeting back in the office, which meant our staff who attended could run to their desk and get something, which we didn't get when we had offline. Even when we were in person, we were on a, a distant uh, location. But on the other hand, I'm a member of the um, American Grazing, American Solar Grazing Association. And this association involves people worldwide who graze underneath solar panels. And of course, why even have a in-person meeting? You might as well have it out in a field someplace if you wanted to have something different. So for that, even a full Zoom a meeting is so much more involved in the world than having something that you have to attend. Um, and that is the thing that I'm... Uh... I'm trying to decide now, and I'm working with some of our teams back at Extension to decide is how do we move forward? What can we take that was really, really good during COVID uh, programming and keep that? But what can we keep from prior to COVID that was really good too and not lose our connections? And I think there are some communities that this is going to work really well with. And I think there are some communities that we're going to have to go back to in-person or maybe just stay online. Um, so I was just kind of curious what everyone else is doing. Okay, Leslie says wrap it up. So two outputs, we have two publications. Uh, and so those are available online. And our future plans, we really don't have any of this grant is pretty much done. Um, however, the question was asked several times during all of the follow up surveys. It, in, what about uh, static composting? What are you guys doing? We don't do anything with it. It's not our style of composting. So there's opportunity there. And we learned some really cool stuff on the tour the other day with Eric. Okay, with that, we already did questions. So unless there's anything online, I think we're 